get the clicker. Does somebody have a clicker for me? It's right up there. Okay, very good. Thank you. How are you doing? Okay, it's good to see you. Um, I need to do one bit of work before we start. And that is I need evidence. So everybody just say hi. There you go. Very good. Okay, that's it. All right, hello. So uh, my name is Mike Amundsen. I'm really happy to be here at API Days um, and uh, talk to you about this idea of uh, bots on the net. Um, so we'll do some introductions before we start, and then we'll kind of get into this notion of bots, sort of the history of what bots and robots and chatbots are like, what they're telling us today, and what we can start to expect in the future. So this is me. This is how you can find me on uh, GitHub and LinkedIn and Twitter, and I would love to connect with you. I'd love to learn about what you're doing, what you're working on, what's challenging for you. Uh, so please, uh, connect with me if you can, and, and, and remind me, just say API Days Paris, and I'll, I'll make sure that I've met you, I'll know that I've met you. You can also find me uh, at a landing page, where I talk about some of the training and services I, I work on. And I'm here partly uh, due to a, com a company called API Academy. Actually, it's a great group of people, I think you've heard about them already today, but I'm very honored to be part of the Academy and uh, the things that they're doing. The last book project that we just worked on the Academy is called the Continuous API Management. I'm just going to offer this up to you. You can take a look at this book. Uh, we're very excited. We had a book signing here yesterday. This, I got to see the print for the first time yesterday. So I'm very excited to see that, and you can look at that as well. OK, got that out of the way. So let's talk about bots. What do I mean when I talk about bots? Well, really, if we want to think about bots and robots and where all this comes from, I'm going to go back to almost 100 years ago with this uh, title, this play, called Rossum's Universal Robots from uh, the Czech writer Karol Čapek. 1920, he writes this science fiction story where um, a man creates these creatures that he called robati or robata. And in the Czech language, that's the closest to a soulless slave, a person who has to work for you and has no real soul. So these are robots. And this is where we get the word robot from this, from this play. What's an in, it's interesting is this story from almost 100 years ago is where the robots kill all the humans and take over the world. <laughs> so apparently this idea has been around for a while. So this is like the Terminator 100 years ago. It's a very interesting story. It's a relatively short play. And Karl Čepek wrote several other really amazing um, uh, uh, speculative fiction pieces 100 years ago that involved society, work, money, motivation, there's uh, beliefs. It's an amazing set of writings, so I would encourage you to read them. So this is where we get the word robot. So let's talk a little bit about how we think about robots today. So robots and chatbots, online bots, are, are expected to really balloon within the next 10 to 15 years. I've got some figures here um, from a, a place called uh, 16 Best, and they do a lot of stuff when they talk about online bots. So there's lots of opportunity being, suspect, uh, being seen in the notion of using bots online, creating places. Ray Kurzweil, who uh, talks about the singularity, says pretty soon bots and humans will be indistinguishable. These are all the things people are talking about. As of 2016, there were 30,000 different bots operating on Facebook, which may be why we're having trouble. But business loves the notion of bots. They think they can save money. They think they can create, increase reach. They think they can save time and improve the quality of delivery. These are all reasons that people are thinking about using bots in some way or another. Some people here may actually be working on creating bots for various platforms, whether it's inside or outside the, an organization. But what I find really interesting is PricewaterhouseCoopers says that when it you, comes to asking consumers, when it comes to asking individuals about their opinion of these chatbots and how they might use them, a very different picture starts to emerge. You can see from this slide here that very few people think any of these kinds of bots are really going to be a positive experience for them. Most of the numbers are very, very low. You can barely get up to, what is there, there's somebody that actually gets up to 17%. Of the, of the consumers think that I might use a bot as an advisor or, or as a teacher or as a manager, right? What they think of bots. 
So this is pretty interesting. So this tells us something, that there's a big challenge about this use of bots that we need to think of before we even get deep into this, before we think about investing a lot of time and money in this. And that is that while technologists think this is going to change the world, we're going to have bots everywhere, and pretty soon you won't be able to distinguish a bot from a human online. And while providers and marketers and salespeople are all set and ready to jump right in to start making lots and lots of these in order to save money and time and improve their, their bottom line, consumers aren't so sure. Now, is that because consumers are way behind because they don't understand how great this is going to be? Or is that because consumers have some, some important reticence, some, some concerns, some things they need to think about? Where does all this lead us? Where does this gap lead us, this, this difference between technologists and providers and consumers. Let's talk about that a little bit. By the way, each one of my title slides has a little poem on it. That poem is written by a machine, by a bot. So you'll get to see Rachter's poetry throughout this, uh, this talk. So. This notion of bots and, and can we uh, start to create machines that are indistinguishable from humans is most popular in current times, in the modern times, coming from Alan Turing, where Alan came up with this idea that could we somehow create an imitation game? Could we create a game where we can test to see if humans can tell whether or not they're talking to a machine or whether or not they're talking to another human when they're just talking over the wire? So often you hear this idea of the t imitation game or the Turing test as a way to think about the difference. So somebody that uh, took this idea of the imitation game very seriously was Joseph Wiesenbaum, uh, who in the 60s wrote an application that he called ELIZA. And he sort of set the stage for some of the modern versions of these digital bots. And we called it uh, ELIZA, uh, and you could talk in, uh, to ELIZA at a, at a sort of a teletype. You'd type a sentence, and then ELIZA would answer back to you. And Eliza was designed to kind of be a, a bit of a psychologist, a bit of your psychiatrist, somebody that you could sort of confide in. Um, and, and she would say things like, is, is there something bothering you? Or, and I, I could say, or I'm worried, or I don't like my mother, or whatever I want to do. And then I would have this conversation with Eliza. The, the name, by the way, comes from this play uh, that was originally uh, made into a movie called My Fair Lady and the story of Pygmalion, this notion of turning something like, and, and training, in this case of the play, training this woman to sort of uh, confuse everyone else, to trick everyone else into thinking she was this very proper English woman when she was just a regular uh, lowly person. So that's where the name comes from. So Eliza was actually pretty amazingly effective in the 1960s. Eliza could carry out conversations, you could type in, and it would seem to understand what was going on. It would talk back. Oh, why is it that you're unhappy today? Why don't you? And I'd say, well, you know, I had a problem at work. Well, why don't you tell me more about what happened at work? It would, you know, interact with you in this way. And, and uh, especially early on, Eliza could fool users. There were people who thought they were talking to a human. It was winning at the imitation game, at the Turing test. But of course, we know from the 1960s, and you can find examples of Eliza working today, you can tell now, a couple of uh, generations later, that, oh, this is really just, really an imitation. This, this bot doesn't understand anything. It's simply mimicking phrases. It's taking words from what I say and answering them back, right? So today, we can sort of look at Eliza and see that it's quite primitive. Eliza was a kind of specialized AI, a kind of specialized, it had very narrow space. If you started talking to Eliza about particle physics, it wouldn't work. It was easily the game was up, right? But as long as you stayed in this sort of feelings zone, it looked like you were doing pretty good. Another specialized AI or, or, or small world AI is a thing called Sherdlu, which happened in the same several years by Tim Winograd at MIT. What he did is he actually went one bit further, not just words, but created objects in a kind of a, um, a fake three-dimensional space in virtual worlds. And you could say things like, pick up the red block or pick up the triangle, and this machine would actually follow your instructions. So this is more like sort of the traditional robot that, uh, that Chapek was talking about, right? This notion that would do something for you. And Shirley was quite popular, and again, at the time, in the 60s, thought to be quite amazing. And what Shirley did is actually started to help us blend that physical and virtual world. So it wasn't just text. Now it's this idea of three dimensions and space and stuff like that. So even in li the limited way that we would, uh, our computers worked uh, in 50 years ago, we could start to create this 3D world. 
So both Sherlu and Eliza are these specialized AI or micro-world elements. Micro-worlds are very domain-specific. I'm in the world of moving boxes. I'm in the world of talking about your feelings. I'm in the world of assembling a car. I'm in the world of actually welding this plate. Specialized micro-worlds are actually relatively easy to do. It's sp domain-specific, and it, it's, it's, it, it's a kind of a limited kind of space. The challenge is it doesn't really scale well. You can't really teach a domain-specific platform to start to learn something new. It doesn't learn at all. And a matter of fact, all it knows is what it's been given sort of from the start. And that's where we were in the 60s and 70s in the, in the sense of what we were doing with, with bots and AI. So the notion was, well, how can I scale this robot in some way? How can I get this robot to start stretching out and doing other things? And that's sort of the next step. And that's the step that we've experienced over the last 20 years or so. I like this poem a lot. I just love this poem. This is so cool. It's almost, it's almost like a Zen Cohen. Like at the end, it's like, what? Utensil? So um, along comes Kenneth Colby. Kenneth Colby's fascinated by Eliza when he's, when he's reading Eliza because Kenneth Colby is actually a psychologist. Kenneth Colby understands a lot about the interaction between the, the psychologist and the patient. And he says, you know, what's really going on here is something very, very different. It's not just the echoing of terms. You can do more. So he had actually been using... Uh, he and several others, but he in particular had been using the ELISA as a way to train his, uh, his students. Like, notice how it echoes and backs and so on and so forth. And he said, you know, I think I can go one better to help train my students. So he invented his own simulated bot. And instead of being called ELISA, it was called Perry. Perry the schizophrenic paranoid. Turns out he could create a bot that was paranoid and would be a great way to teach his students. So this, this bot would answer in all sorts of strange and unusual ways. What's really great is in the 70s, somebody got the notion of getting Perry the Paranoid and Eliza together. This is a beautiful idea. This is going to work out great. Um, so this is, there's actually a transcript of one of these conversations that you can find online in the IETF. You, know, you, you might notice up in the corner, Vince Cerf is the person who actually uh, uh, submitted this, this transcript into the records. And it's wonderful, the two of them really got on each other's nerves. Now there's some amazing things that came out of the Perry the Paranoid uh, uh, application. So first of all, Perry was also pretty good, pretty good at fooling humans. There were a lot of psychologists that were thinking that this is really a paranoid person. It turns out it was also easier to write the paranoid than it was the non-paranoid uh, mimic, right? Because if you just say something at random and you tell, tell someone they're paranoid, it'll probably work out, right? So it turns out it's easier to mimic personalities that are unhealthy. Now, the other thing that was really fascinating about the way uh, Perry was programmed is rather than actually just manipulating sentences and echoing back, Perry was actually tuned in to the sort of the cognitive words, the way people would speak, not just the topics they would speak about. And in fact, this has a lot to do with the pronouns they would use. Often, uh, psychologists and, and other analysts tell you the pronouns you use, I and me and we, and things like that are much more indicative of your mental state than anything uh, else. So it's really quite interesting. So this sort of created another level and starts us onto the notion of actually programming behavior or pro programming to understand reaction. So Perry uses the same specialized area. It's a, it's a limited space, a limited zone. But now Perry pays attention to behavior and can actually mimic some of the behavior as well using even different words. So encoding behavior becomes really, really important. And this is really the sort of the next stage of AI. Here's the challenge. When we begin to encode behavior, whether it's my behavior that I encode into a machine or yours or some collective information that we have, we actually expose the biases that we operate on every day. Right? The world I live in, the, the eyes I see, the way I look at the world, 
that has a sense of bias, a series of biases. When I see things, they look a lot more like technical problems than, a lot, than my, uh, some of my colleagues who live in other fields, right? So I have all sorts of biases. And I want to talk about a couple of these. So I want to talk about latent bias. Latent bias is bias that's actually built into the implementation, right? So uh, the ability to perceive, the ability to actually operate. And there's also selection bias. Selection bias is often uh, hap happening in the algorithms that uh, we use to determine something, whether something is good or whether something is bad or whether something is exciting or boring. That's usually some algorithm that decides sort of on a qualitative level. And finally, there's a thing called interaction bias, and that is the bias that comes from interacting with the world. One of the things we've found in the last 10 to 15 years is as we build bots to start interacting with the world, you can teach bots to be really, really mean. You can insert your bias into the bots. And in fact, that's, a, that's an amazing attack vector for bots that are trying to learn, as you can make, turn them into bias, uh, bias machines. So I'll give you just some really quick examples of these, because we don't really have a lot of time to go through all of them. But this uh, is an example of a latent bias uh, uh, display. I type into Google the word doctor and ask for pictures. And what I get back is something that's relatively biased. Let's see, I have one, two females, one of them a cartoon that's listed in, a, in about eight or 10 of these. In the United States today, more than 50% of all new entrants into the doctor field are women. That is not being reflected here for me. Now there's another context, my context. My, all the doctors that, that, were, that I uh, attend to happen to be women, that's a 100% filter, right? That's not here either. And we haven't even begun to talk about race, I've just talked about gender. Now this is not, a, not, not something that someone's designed in, but it turns out that bias in the way information is selected is, is not reflecting what my life really reflects. And it's certainly not reflecting what others might reflect as well. I've tried this in several countries. I get about the same answer from Google. However, it's very unscientific. I've not tried it with lots of other people. Google may be super smart, knows I'm a white man, and that's why it's delivering this to me. I don't really know. Selection bias is a little bit different. This is sort of a qualitative element. So when I type in the word beauty in Google, and by the way, I'm just using Google because Google is handy. Google is not unique to any of the other search engines. And um, this is, these are the first set of pictures that I get. What fascinates me a lot about this response is if you look at the sort of sub-filters along the top, the names that they've offered to me, so Korean or inner or African or Chinese or classic, I'm not sure what that means, you know what it doesn't offer to me? White, right? Because that's a, sort of a bias built in, right? And I actually checked, there's an arrow over there. there it's not over there further. So, so this is a kind of bias from the selection from the data that's available. This may be uh, collected from data and, and it has information about who's said yes or who's rated things and stuff like that. And again, this is not malicious, this is just sort of the, the result of data. This is my favorite one. Does anybody remember Tay? Does anybody remember Tay? Yes. Tay was this sort of learning, this interaction uh, machine on Twitter. Within 16 hours, it was taken offline because it became so disgusting. It was taught to say so many bad things, just in a matter of hours, that they simply had to take it offline completely. This is probably the least offensive element that I could share with you. 16 hours, okay? So it's really, this, this, is, this is sort of like the real nut, you know, the real amazing part of this, right? So if you think about this, there are biases that have to do with the way we construct the bot. There are biases with the way we, we have the initial uh, values that we use to select. And there are biases when it learns from others. And this learning from others is a big danger. This also points up something that, that we've discovered in the last 10 years or so, the power of negative thinking. This idea of negative thinking turns out to be a built-in biological element. You know, uh, Reese was talking a lot about biological parallels. It turns out our brains, for lots of important survival reasons over the uh, millennia, are triggered on danger. We actually think, uh, we notice danger as, as quickly 
uh, much more quickly than uh, pleasure. We elevate pain. We elevate the idea of danger. We elevate our fear level as a way to protect us. It's much better to be overly fearful than overly trusting if you want to survive in the world. There's this thing called loss aversion. Loss aversion is this notion that there's about a, uh, you need about 1.5 uh, as many gains as you, as, as you do losses in order to think you're even. Right? This, this comes up in betting, this is used in marketing and all sorts of other things. Loss aversion is one of the key elements that drives FOMO. Do we know this thing? The fear of missing out, right? Oh, you've lost, you've missed a lot of posts. You better log on again and catch up with all your friends. You know, instead of saying, you know, we haven't seen you in a while, I bet you're enjoying yourself, but you might want to check online. Nobody's going to do that. By creating a loss, by creating uh, some kind of fear, by uh, some kind of missing out element, I can trigger much more behavior. Marketers have known this for hundreds of years, right? This is not something that's brand new, but we're being faced with it much more readily today as we try to automate things. So our brain uh, reacts more strongly uh, to negative stimulus. Boy, you know what that means? That means if I live in an online world where I'm paid on clicks, where I'm paid on reaction, where I'm paid on sharing, what am I going to do? I'm going to do the thing that's much more likely to get you to react, and that is press negative buttons. We've even come up with a word for it, triggering, right? So this is another thing that's come out of this notion of automation that we have to be really concerned about when we think of bots. Now, Tay was a learning kind of bot. It's not a general learning experience, but it, it's a machine learning pattern. It would take information and categorize it and then incorporate that information into its future responses and its future selections. So this is primarily based on statistics. Right? So the statistical possibility that these people type this thing in means that I'll use it more often or that I'll correlate it in some kind of way. So that means that we can learn without being explicitly programmed. That means the data that passes through becomes part of our reaction. Well, I, I, this is an old quote from Peter Norvig, and I, and I really like it. I, I don't think it's, the, it's changed, and I think people forget about this quote. It turns out, statistically, at some point, adding another million records to your cache of a billion doesn't statistically change the, the quality of information that you're getting out. Your learning curve starts to flatten out pretty quickly. And it's pretty much an S-curve. We, we can talk about this at some other times, but a learning starts out slow, and then you hit a sort of a point where there's this sort of a tipping point, and then you can learn very, very quickly, and then it starts to taper off. And what Norving was saying back in 2013, and what I, I'm still reading in lots and lots of material, is that we're tapering off on our ability to improve learning or improve performance or uh, success on statistics alone. So this challenge of this, of this uh, uh, machine learning pattern sort of faces in a couple of ways. We always, when people talk about AI, often they're assuming this, uh, this generalized intelligence, this sort of like human brain kind of thing. Um, I heard once from a guy by the name of Mel Kahn when he said that the, the job of the brain is to create a brain. Right? is not to learn anything specific, but to create this learning machine that we can do lots and lots of things with. Where basically, it has to do with this notion of learning and planning and reasoning. Uh, learning and planning and reasoning. So I learn something, and then I use it in my plans, and then I reason about how successful I was, that I get to the cheese, that I uh, solve my problem, that I get the raise I wanted. Whatever we do, our ability to learn always involves these things, learning, planning, and reasoning. And we still don't really understand how to create that in an electronic form. Any intellectual task that a human can do is what we think we want to be doing with its generalized AI. But as we have looked at lots and lots of things, you can probably see this. It's not really happening right now. So this goes back to the Turing idea, right? So I mentioned the Turing test earlier, and I like the Turing test a lot. The Turing test, it turns out, isn't really a, a really good measure of whether or not you're human in any way, but it's a good measure about whether or not you can be fooled. And we all know that we can be fooled. Magicians know how to fool us, right? There are lots of possibilities. And we don't need magicians to do it. We have all sorts of optical illusions and all sorts of other things that fool us, right? So the Turing test is, is kind of out of date. This is one of my favorite tests. Steve Wozniak, uh, uh, former founder at Apple, has always got a really playful sense. And I love this idea of the coffee test. 
You put a machine into it until it's got to go into a home and figure out how to make coffee in that house. It's got to find out where the coffee pot is, where the coffee is, how this thing works, how you plug it in, turn it on, whatever you're going to do, get the little packet thing in there, close it, whatever it's got to happen. That, I think, is an interesting test of a bot. Send a robot in to make coffee. Because now you can imagine all sorts of the decisions that have to be made. Right? It isn't just a reading through statistics. It turns out algorithms are what we use to actually drive these machine bots, right? We give algorithms. We say, um, I need you to use this algorithm to decide which message I should give to Mike first, which one's most important, which one should be alerted. Algorithms are how we're using, uh, creating self-driving cars as well. And big data is the fuel for all of those algorithms, right? So that's why big data is so important. Because the more data you have, the more opportunity you have. The challenge is, if we just treat the data as statistics, we're going to end up on that, on that back end of the curve relatively soon. All right, so where does that lead us? We've talked about the, the ideas of bots, what, what consumers think of them, what providers think of them. We've talked about the history of Eliza and Perry and Tay and these other creatures. Where is this, where is this going to go? Well, like everything else, there's a sort of a good news, bad news story here, right? So the bad news is there are amazing places where you can fall into and get in a lot of trouble. Uh, and and this, this writer in particular, Zainab Tufaki, has done some amazing things. Uh, one of the, one of the, uh, this article about YouTube, basically, what she did is she logged into YouTube and kept clicking on the very first thing it suggests to her. Next, 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 next. And pretty soon she said she's in this um, really creepy, scary place of fear. Because fear drives clicks. And the algorithms at YouTube essentially says the most clicked thing gets the top view, right? So, it, so this is really bad news. It turns out this triggering fear, this ability to get us excited, to get us to react to something, is exactly what was used during the previous election time. It was used, has been used all over the world. That's basically what a lot of misinformation technique is about, is to get us af afraid and get us worried. A lot of us have, done, have seen this material. Some of us have shared this material, even when we didn't think we were. The thing we have to keep in mind as we move forward and we think about building bots that are going to interact with humans is they're extremely likely to contain bias. Humans contain bias. We operate in a bias space. We're not looking for a bias-free zone. That's not going to happen, but we have to be aware we have to talk about them, and we have to deal with them. And especially if you're creating learning machines, if you're out there trying to create a machine that's going to learn from your customers, be aware and be prepared about what they're going to learn and what those bots are going to share with your customers once they learn it. I can think of a lot of great Hollywood scripts just on that idea alone. So again, bias is, is the, the, the driving data and the code rewrite. And this negative stimulus has to do with the fuel and the data that we, that, we, uh, that we collect along the way and try to use. These become fulcrum points that we can start to focus in on. How can we write better code? How can we notice bias in the things that we're implementing? How can we do a better job using training data? How can we uh, find uh, biases and try to remove them in training data early? How can we do training data that reflects what the person we want to be rather than the person we are today, for example? And I think there's some things that we can do in a couple of different ways. I looked at some regulations and looked at some, some things. So US regulations on, uh, on bots and, and AI and stuff like that focuses most, mostly on national security. That's really not a surprise in the US. When it comes to cyber systems, the US really thinks first about their danger, like they're triggered in their own kind of way. In the UK, most of it uh, focuses on data production and data portability, the ability to get data that you need, the ability to share data properly, and the ability to keep data in the hands of just the, the proper people. Here in France, I see most of the talk about um, AI and, and uh, chatbots and security focuses a lot on transparency, knowing who you're dealing with, whether or not this is a machine, and where this data comes from, which I think is really interesting. And of course, as you might imagine, at the UN, they're kind of incorporating all of these sorts of things. The importance of national security, the importance of portability and protection, the importance of transparency in dealing is all being written into some uh, very important elements on the United Nations AI policies. So that's encouraging. But I think there's sp some specific things that we can do to make things better. 
First of all, even people who today aren't fans of these AI, they can imagine things in the future that they might trust bots to do. Tax preparer. Well, those are not people, those are tasks. Those are jobs. And there's not a lot of context that you can, get, you can mess up. And there's not a lot of planning and reasoning and learning involved in these elements. These are great opportunity zones for creating a machines that help us. Just like uh, when Reese was talking about how we used uh, stones and sticks and hammers to help us as we grew, we can use these kinds of machines to do that. Family assistants and health coaches and financial advisors, this is sort of the next level up. Now we're sort of asking opinion. Here's statistical information. All the learnings and teachings from doctors and uh, finance history and stuff like that could be very valuable. And again, there's not a lot of context problem in this space. There's a little, but it's relatively low. We can still find some great value here. So that leads us to this idea of task-focused bots. Task-focused bots work in the micro-world space, the very earliest ones that we were talking about half a century ago in the 1960s. And we still haven't realized all the possibilities from this. If we stay domain-specific, if we, if we stay task-focused so we don't need to do planning and reasoning, if we focus on these task-focused micro-worlds, we can scale them quite a bit. We can think about task-focused microservices, micro-bots, bots that do just this one thing. Some of the power might come from having a family of bots that I ask questions to rather than one bot that's supposed to know them all, right? And I can, I can interplay with them and I can make the decisions. I can get the information and make the, the, the reasoning and the planning. Uh, there's also a few regulation elements that I think we can still consider that are pretty interesting. These are the ones that I think I've seen right away and, and I've heard other people talk about as well. Self-identifying rules right up front. You are talking to a bot. I remember Google had a little dis uh, a sort of a demo where they had some uh, voice-activated chat machine call up and make an appointment at, you know, at a hair salon or something like that. And, and they, they touted it as this thing that it, they had fooled the person at the hair salon, right? That they didn't know they were talking to a machine. I find that kind of creepy. I don't want to find out I was just talking to a machine. I want to know up front. I want to know up front. So that, I think this self-identifying rule is very powerful. License to operate laws could be very powerful as well. This bot is licensed by X Corporation. This is in acting in, in, uh, you know, on behalf of a certain corporation or person. Now it's difficult to hide behind things, right? This is sort of like uh, truth and lending or laboring laws, la labeling laws. Insurance underwriting for privacy, protection, and offense. Right? If I have to buy insurance for my bot, suddenly I'm doing things differently. And insurance regulators are going to start to create a market and start talking about what the risks are for bots. And it's going to create a nice regulatory space for us. We don't have to come up with rules. We can use some market effects as well to make sure that we stay in the proper zone. We can also consider opening up the training data uh, we have a lot of focus on open source code. We've had this for the last 25 years or so. Maybe it's now time to start focusing on open data that we can use and use over again that everyone can use, right? Governments have all sorts of statistical data about weather and all sorts of other things. Maybe they can start sharing some of that and start helping those of us who are writing bots to train. Okay, so how can we wrap up? Remember what I started talking about, the idea that we've got a gap here, we've got a challenge between the technologists, the providers who think they want to make some money at this, and the individuals who are going to be the ones that need to interact with whatever is implemented. Uh, we can think about this idea of task-focused microworlds as a way to, there's lots and lots of opportunity here. We don't have to create uh, super or super bots in order to get a lot of value out of this. Focus on these task-focused microworlds that don't require context. Beware of creating Perry chatbots, right? Beware of creating things where you're driving negativity, where you're, you're actually relying or ignoring inbuilt biases, because that's going to get you in lots of trouble, especially it's going to get your company in lots of trouble. And finally, there are lots and lots of opportunities. The acceptance of them is growing, as particularly uh, for millennials. There are lots more opportunities. So this is a generational element. But it's important that we maintain their trust and we maintain what, what we really uh, uh, promise to them rather than making their lives worse. 
Okay, so let's just end with this. Really, it's up to us. Which way do we go? How do we use this technology? And what do we do to make our worlds better is all up to the people here in this room. We're the ones who are going to build these in the future. We're the ones who are going to help people understand how to use them. Because bots offer a future of lots and lots of possibilities. Most of those possibilities are positive. And those are the ones that we should be selecting. Those are the ones that can help us take that next step and level up. Because just like there was Eliza, and there was Perry, and there were Tay, and other ones, there are going to be more and more. We're going to get better and better at this. And that's really the future of bots on the net. So thank you very much. Thanks.